One Piece took the cover of the magazine, this time with a cool shot of Luffy atop a pile of riches while holding a hairless brook-like skull. And considering the contents of the chapter itself, this is surprisingly fitting. Speaking of which, we also received a color spread that fits several of the more free-spirited One Piece ladies, which actually managed to spark up a bit of controversy since Yamato is here too. I really want to know what you guys think. Do you see any issue with Yamato being here? Either way, I'm much more interested in Vivi to her left. Kicking things off, several guards inside Pangea Castle have been defeated by fiery attacks. Once he'd taken them all down, Sabo tried to catch his breath. But just then, a woman rushed through the door, confident that the man in front of her was Sabo. Recognizing her to be Jewelry Bonnie, with a smile on her face, she told him that since they're after the same thing, they should skip the small talk. While they ran through the castle, it would be said that they broke into the guards' quarters and stole the slave collar keys. Sabo would express that he had heard Kuma had a daughter, but this was their first time meeting. Apparently, Bonnie had always kept tabs on the activity of the Revolutionary Army, which is why she knew Sabo and his forces could be trusted to get Kuma's body to safety. At first, I wondered why she didn't just join up with the Revolutionaries, but considering her number one priority was getting her dad back as soon as possible, their objectives didn't align entirely. Besides, being a pirate provided a lot more freedom. Freedom we'll see on full display later on in the chapter. Scattering some soot, Sabo would call upon Karasu in the form of one of his soot crows, much to Bonnie's astonishment. Sabo confirmed the completion of his mission and asked for the keys to be delivered, along with more lay securing of Kuma and the others, before finally heading back to headquarters. As he took the keys elsewhere, Karasu wondered about Sabo, who'd assure him that he wouldn't be far behind. Now, the ability to manipulate the element of his fruit from this great of a distance is incredible. Not to mention the fact that even just a piece of him can see, hear, and speak. Also, he seems to maintain this whole crow thing for aesthetic purposes. This is a very skilled double fruit user that we are dealing with. Sabo would then look to Bonnie, wondering what she would be doing next. She planned on heading over to Egghead Island to see if Vegapunk would be able to restore Kuma's mind. And just before she could finish expressing her homicidal thoughts, the two were noticed by a guard who'd call out to more. Grabbing hold of Bonnie like the princess we now know her to be, Sabo managed to hide them up above. Because of this, the guard who'd spotted them began to second-guess himself like an NPC during the stealth part of a video game. Another, who was only just catching up, remarked that it felt like there were less guards than ever these days, believing they were too short-handed to effectively secure the entire place. Another would question how in the loop their comrade happened to be, then saying that they can blame you-know-what for that problem. When they didn't seem to get it, the other added that they're all gone because of it. Seeing them still confused, the informant would name it to be the legendary Phantom Room, something the third guard dismissed to be complete nonsense. But listening in, this supposedly hazardous location caught Sabo's attention immediately. I'm guessing they're talking about Imu's room or where we saw the giant straw hat. What do you guys think? Shortly afterward, the two were back outside, and Bonnie was quick to thank Sabo for his help. Taking a look at some papers, Sabo would tell her that since Egghead was in the New World, she was headed in the opposite direction, so he just wished her safe travels there. And thankfully, his brother's crew got there before she ended up drowning. Bonnie was clearly kept away from her father's previous companions, as she found it a bit strange that a so-called radical revolutionary was being so friendly to her. Not looking to make himself out to be a hero just like Luffy, Sabo would just remind her that they're both set on saving the same person, so their objectives align which again reassured her as she asked him to look after her dad again before heading to the seas. But my friends, it is time for the Gorosei meeting of the century. Standing before the seated sovereign, the five elders recognized King Cobra, the ruler of Alabasta, and immediately wanted to know what he had come to ask of them. To this, King Cobra prepared to start from the very beginning. He began with some information they already knew that the world government was founded 800 years ago when 20 different monarchs all came together under a single banner. From then on, their families all moved to the Holy Land so that they could all live as one people, one clan. They are known as the Celestial Dragons. For the ones responsible for the creation of the world as it is known, they have furthermore ruled over their creation since then. Internally, the 20 families were all considered to be equal and as a testament to that promise, to ensure that no one tyrant could ever arise from among them, the empty throne was established. And in front of it, each of the founding monarchs placed a single sword, 
symbolizing their eternal vow to never sit upon it. While simultaneously, new monarch families were carefully crafted to rule the many nations of the world that the celestial dragons themselves could no longer directly control. And those very families remained in power even now. For the sake of ensuring a smooth transition of power, any and all references to the previous dynasty's reign were removed from each of the founder's representative home countries. They were no longer to be seen as humans, but as gods. That was, with the sole exception of his kingdom. Alabasta's monarch at the time was a woman by the name of Queen Lily of House Nefertari. And while her name was forever immortalized as one of the founding 20 families, unlike the others, she didn't stay to become a celestial dragon. And let me just say that this silhouette is not only ominous, it looks especially similar to the outline of Imu. That being said, Oda already has us all fighting for our lives against possibly misleading silhouettes, but Lily Nefertari and Vivi Nefertari sound pretty damn similar to me. I used to joke about Vivi being Imu for some dumb reason, and although that is clearly not the case, being anywhere close to that is downright ridiculous. That being said, we can't just forget that after tearing up the images of Luffy, Blackbeard, and Shirahoshi, Imu decides to keep Vivi's photo fully intact as they made their way to the empty throne. So we've got Joy Boy, a relative of this clearly important queen, an ancient weapon, and whatever Blackbeard is. Oda is a very clever man. When Crocodile was on a call with Mr. Prince in Alabasta, he held and destroyed a flower. But not just any old flower, it was a lily. And later on with a cover page, the very same flower was placed in front of King Cobra as he read the paper and smiled with Vivi, who is now with the big bird behind the papers. I seriously can't blame anyone for coming up with tinfoil hat theories when it comes to this series, since things like this exist. Anyways, instead of settling in the Holy Land, Queen Lily returns to her home of Alabasta to continue as their ruler. Which is precisely why his family, the Nefertari, remained in power there. Which meant that only 19 of the swords were ever placed around the empty throne. The Lorax looking Gorose would confirm everything Cobra had said to be factual, but would question the point of his statements. King Cobra admitted to having scoured all of his kingdom's ancient texts. But based on his findings, all known accounts that chronicled the period of time directly after the Void Century had one thing in common. Her name was never once mentioned. Something that immediately caught the Gorose off guard. And listen, this whole dot 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 thing has to end. The sheer amount of stress they invoke is downright criminal. This man Oda really knows how to tell a good story. It would seem that Queen Lily never made it home to Alabasta. As such, the responsibility of ruling the country was left to her younger brother. With all this, Cobra would ask his first question wondering if they had any record of what happened to her. St. J. Garcia Saturn would finally speak. Putting it bluntly, he'd say that 800 years is quite a long time ago. Again, it was true that out of the 20 families, the Nefertari family did not move to marry Joa. But it was believed that Queen Lily made her way back to Alabasta after making that decision. And after regurgitating everything Cobra had just said, like a politician that really didn't want to tell the truth, he'd apologize adding that the details of her motives and journey had been lost to history. So they were just as clueless about it all as he was. Pausing, clearly knowing there was no turning back, King Cobra would then question, what was the meaning of D? Which was a different sort of reaction, no question marks at all, they were now alert. The intent behind the question would be asked of first, as the collective demeanor of them all shifted to one of extreme tension. Being even more truthful, King Cobra would inform them that a short letter written by Queen Lily had been passed down from generation to generation for all those years. Something that judging by the question mark with this one, they were not aware of. Imu had been listening in this entire time, so the contents of this letter will be very important indeed. Now there is more insanity from the throne room to come, but before then we have this straw hat grand fleet issuing a declaration of war. Back in the public courtyard of the castle, a loud and pleading female voice would be heard as a mangled kuma tended to the chains around her. Princess Shirahoshi was in the process of being captured yet again by the filthy St. Charlos in front of several admirers. Beaming with glee, St. Charlos could not help but wonder what Shirahoshi eats, seeing her more like an exotic pet than a person, adding in that he plans to ride her to town every day, and if she didn't listen, she would only know pain. 
All she could do now was cry out for help from all those around her. But seeing as her father and all the guards were still in the meeting tower and they were absolutely terrified, all these men made a run for it. What Shirohoshi could only see as heartless. As far as they were concerned, they didn't see anything. Meanwhile, St. Charles was preoccupied by the fact that his mermaid had told him no, unwilling to tolerate any sort of defiance. To rationalize their cowardice, these unsightly nobles would remind themselves that she is a stranger and probably wasn't going to accept any of their marriage proposals anyways. As to bust onto the scene was her older brother Fukabushi, who'd command the losers to clear a path. But to this, they'd warn him that to defy a celestial dragon would only doom Fishman Island. Fukaboshi would apologize to Shirahoshi for letting her out of their sight, proposing that they go home and never come back to such a horrible place again. Cursing at the snot no celestial dragon, the brotherly trio charged forward as Kumo was commanded to eradicate them, charging up a beam attack immediately. The royal brothers just barely managed to evade the onslaught as the crowd of cowards seemed to be absolutely eviscerated. Recognizing the then warlord of the seas, Bartholomew Kuma, Fukaboshi would express how sad it was to see how far he had fallen. But unfortunately, they could not afford to give up this fight, so all three were prepared for the worst. St. Charles would call upon Kuma to destroy them all. Not caring about their royal statuses, he figured nobody would complain about some fried fish if they paid the country off with enough money. Just then, Rebecca and the Tontata pirates showed up to help out Shirohoshi. Leo even recognized the fiend responsible, as Mio's guard promised to take full responsibility for what Sai was about to do. But just then, he'd stand in the way of Fukaboshi, telling him that a royal like him needed to show restraint. Seeing Mio's guard who had hit him earlier, St. Charles commanded Kuma to kill his fellow Celestial. But instead, focused on each other, Fukaboshi would demand to know what the difference was, stating their refusal to watch him treat their sister like this. Mio's guard would respond with the fact that escaping would be much easier for them since they didn't have a country to worry about. At the end of the day, they are pirates. As Leo and Sai spun up in the air, preparing their respective attacks, sharing a look of ferocity, meeting high-speed velocity, Shirohoshi would then notice the two fellows just as the remaining onlookers begged them not to do what they were about to do. As the look on St. Charles' face was one he may never be able to express again. As like a pair of world champion whack-a-mole players, they slammed down on the Celestial Dragon's head with incredible force. Embedding him into the ground, St. Charles now looks like something fresh out of Hunter x Hunter. Crying out, the crowd knew that they were all done for. Hitting a Celestial Dragon was bad enough. Killing one was unheard of. As Kuma's blaster charged, the crowd of onlookers were certain that an admiral would be soon to appear. But before he could fire, Morley emerged from the ground, embracing his former friend while telling them all to stop picking on Kuma. Assuring him that he wouldn't need to listen to anyone's orders ever again, a tearful Morley was prepared to bring his friend home. The sudden emergence of a giant just took things from bad to worse in the eyes of the crowd. Just then, Karasu's crow would appear, informing Morley that they'd gotten the keys. Then realizing that these were intruders, it wouldn't be long before they recognized Morley to be a commander of the Revolutionary Army as the rebels made their swift escape. Meanwhile, St. Roswald was in an utter uproar over what they had done to his son. The Straw Hat Grand Fleet is now involved in this declaration of war between the Revolutionary Army and the world government. Based on the fact that the title of the chapter is The Attempted Murder of a Celestial Dragon and the fact that this is One Piece, Unfortunately, St. Charles is probably still alive. But what a mess! I mean, Luffy probably wouldn't have had it any other way since they were protecting his friend, and he's punched the same Celestial Dragon, and declared war on the world government during Ennis Lobby, but still, this isn't a light offense. But heading back to the Gorosei meeting, Imu slowly approached the Empty Throne. Bewildered, the Gorosei would cry out to the Great Imu that King Cobra was still in attendance. Completely shocked, Cobra would lean forward as nothing but dread washed over his face. And then, Imu spoke. Repeating Queen Lily's name, the red, hawk-like eyes would peer at the sovereign below. Then, without hesitation, sit atop the empty throne. A grandiose declaration in and of itself. The time may have finally come for one of the biggest reveals 
and One Piece history. Drop your craziest Imu identity theories in the comments since it might just be the last chance we get. If anyone's right, or at least right enough, expect to see your comments show up in the next one. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.